Hey guys, when we stopped the, the other day, um, it was decided that Watson was going to go to Baskerville Hall with Sir Henry um, so that he could kind of keep track of things and know what was going on. Here's where he went. Sorry. Sir Henry Baskerville and Dr. Mortimer were ready upon the appointed day, and we started as arranged for Devonshire. Mr. Sherlock Holmes drove with me to the station and gave me his last parting injunctions and advice. I will not bias your mind by suggesting theories or suspicions, Watson, said he. I wish you simply to report facts in the fullest possible manner to me, and you can leave me to do the theorizing. What sort of facts? I asked. Anything which may seem to have a bearing, however indirect, upon the case, and especially the relations between young Baskerville and his neighbors, or any fresh particulars concerning the death of Sir Charles. I've made some inquiries myself in the last few days, but results have, I fear, been negative. One thing only appears to be certain, and that is that Mr. James Desmond, who is the next heir, is an elderly gentleman of a very amiable disposition. That just means he's nice. So that his persecution does not, so that this persecution does not arise from him. I really think that we may eliminate him entirely from our calculations. There remain the people who will actually surround Sir Henry Baskerville upon the moor. Would it not be well in the first place to get rid of this Barrymore couple? By no means. You could not make a greater mistake. If they are innocent, it would be a cruel injustice. And if they are guilty, we should be giving up all chance of bringing it home to them. No, no, we will preserve them upon our list of suspects. Then there is a groom at the hall. If I remember right, there are two moorland farmers. There is our friend, Dr. Mortimer, whom I believe to be entirely honest. And there is his wife, of whom we know nothing. There is this naturalist. Stapleton, and there is his sister, who is said to be a young lady of attractions. There is Mr. Franklin of Laughter Hall, who is also an unknown factor, and there are one or two other neighbors. These are the folk who must be very your very special study. I will do my best. You have arms, I suppose? He means a gun. Yes, I thought it was well to take them. Most certainly, keep your revolver near you night and day, and never relax your precautions. Our friends had already secured a first-class carriage, and were waiting for us upon the platform. No, we have no news of any kind, said Dr. Mortimer, in answer to my friend's questions. I can swear one thing, and that is that we have not been shadowed during the last two days. We have never gone out without keeping a sharp watch, and no one could have escaped our notice. You have always kept together, I presume? Except yesterday afternoon, I usually give up one day to pure amusement when I come to town, so I spent it at the Museum of the College of Surgeons. And I went to look at the folk in the park, said Baskerville, but we had no trouble of any kind. It was imprudent, just the same said Holmes, shaking his head and looking very grave. I beg, Sir Henry, that you will not go about alone. Some great misfortune will befall you if you do. Did you get your other boot? No, sir. It is gone forever. Indeed. That is very interesting. Well, goodbye, he added as the trail began to glide down the platform. Bear in mind, Sir Henry, one of the phrases in that queer old legend which Dr. Mortimer has read to us, to avoid the more in those hours of darkness, when the powers of evil are exalted. I looked back at the platform when he had left it far behind and saw the tall, austere figure of Holmes standing motionless and gazing after us. The journey was a swift and pleasant one, and I spent it in making the more intimate acquaintance of my two companions and in playing with Dr. Mortimer's spaniel. In a very few hours, the brown earth had become ruddy, the brick had changed to granite, and red cows grazed in well-hedged well fields, and there were lush grasses and more luxuriant vegetation spoke of a richer, if a damper, climate. Young Baskerville stared eagerly out of the window and cried aloud with delight as he recognized the familiar features of the Devon scenery. I've been over a good part of the world since I left it, Dr. Watson, said he, but I have never seen a place to compare with it. I never saw a Devonshire man who did not swear by its county. By his county, I remarked. It depends upon the breed of men quite as much as on the county, said Dr. Mortimer. A glance at our friend here reveals the round head of the Celts, which carries inside it the Celtic enthusiasm and power of attachment. Poor Sir Charles's head was of a very rare type half Gaelic, half Ivernian, in its characteristics. But you were very young when you last saw Baskerville Hall, were you not? I was a boy, in my teens at the time of my father's death, and had never seen the hall, for he lived in a little cottage on the south coast. And thence I went straight to a friend in America. I tell you, it is all as new to me as it is to Dr. Watson, and I am as keen as possible to see the moor. Are you? Then your wish is easily granted, for there is your first sight of the moor, said Dr. Mortimer, pointing out of the carriage window. Over the green squares of the fields and the low curve of the wood, there arose in the distance gray, a gray, melancholy hill, with a strange, jagged summit, dim and vague in the distance, like some fantastic landscape in a dream. Baskerville sat for a long time, his eyes fixed upon it, and I read, in his, and I read upon his eager face how much it meant to him. This first sight of that strange spot where the men of his blood had held sway so long and left their mark so deep. There he sat with his tweed suit and his American accent. 
in the corner of a prosaic railway carriage. And yet as I looked at his dark and expressive face, I felt more than ever how true a descendant he was of that long line of high-blooded, fiery, and masterful men. There were pride, valor, and strength in his thick brows, his sensitive nostrils, and his large hazel eyes. If on that forbidding moor a difficult and dangerous quest should lie before us, this was at least a comrade for whom one might venture to take a risk with certainty that he would bravely share it. The train pulled up at a small wayside station, and we all descended. Outside, beyond the low white fence, a wagonette with a pair of cobs was waiting. Our coming was evidently a great event for for, for station master and porters clustered around us, carrying our luggage, carrying out our luggage. It was a sweet, simple country spot, but I was surprised to observe observe that by the gate there stood two soldierly men in dark uniforms, who leaned upon their short rifles and glanced keenly at us as we passed. The coachman, a hard-faced, gnarled little fellow, saluted Sir Henry Baskerville, and in a few minutes we were flying swiftly down the broad white road, rolling pasture lands curved upward on either side for uh, either side of us. Old gabled houses peeped out from amid the dark, thick green foliage. But behind the peaceful and sunlit countryside, there rose ever dark against the evening sky, the long, gloomy curvy curve of the moor, broken by the jagged and sinister hills. The wagonette swung around into a side road, and we curved on either side, heavy with dripping moss and fleshy heart's tongue. Heart's tongue ferns, bronzing bracken and mottled bramble gleamed in the light of the blinking sun. Still steadily rising, we passed over a narrow granite bridge and skirted a noisy stream which gushed swiftly down, foaming and roaring amid the gray boulders. Both road and stream wound up through, the, through a valley dense with oak, scrub oak and fir. At every turn, Baskerville gave an exclamation of delight, looking eagerly about him and asking countless questions. To his eyes all seemed beautiful, but to me, a tinge of melancholy lay upon the countryside, which bore so clearly the mark of the waning year. Yellow leaves carpeted the lanes and fluted down upon us as we passed. The rattle of our wheels died away as we drove through the drifts of rotting vegetation. Sad gifts, as it seemed to me, for nature to throw before the carriage of the returning heir of the Baskervilles. Hello, cried Dr. Mortimer. What's this? A steep curve of, hell, of heath-clad land, an outlying spur of the moor, lay in front of us. On the summit, hard and clear like an equestrian statue, upon its pedestal was a mounted soldier, dark and stern, his rifle poised and ready over his forearm. He was watching the road along which we traveled. What is this, Perkins? asked Dr. Mortimer. Our driver half turned in his seat. There's a convict escaped from Princetown, sir. He's been out three days now. And the warders watch every road and every station, but they've had no sight of him yet. The farmers about here don't like it, sir, and that's a fact. Well, I understand that they get five pounds if they can give information. And yes, sir, but the chance of five pounds is but a poor thing compared to the chance of having your throat cut. You see, it isn't like an or any ordinary convict. This is a man who would stick at nothing. Who is he, then? It is Selden, the Notting Hill murderer. I remember the case well, for it was one in which Holmes had taken an interest on account of the peculiar ferocity of the crime and the wanton brutality which had marked all the actions of the assassin. The communication of this death sentence had been due to some doubts as to his complete sanity. So atrocious was his conduct. Our wagonette had topped the rise, and in front of us rose the huge expanse of the moor, mottled with gnarled and craggy cairns and tors, a cold wind swept down from it and set us shivering. Somewhere there on that desolate plain was lurking this fiendish man, hiding in a burrow like a wild beast, his heart full of malignancy against the whole race which had cast him out. It needed but this to complete the grim suggestiveness of the barren waste, the chilling wind, and the darkling sky. Even Baskerville felt silent and pulled his overcoat more closely around him. We had left the fertile country behind and beneath us. We looked back on it now, the slanting ray of a low sun turning the streams to threads of gold and glowing on the red new, the red earth new turned by the plow, and the broad tangle of the woodlands. The, broad, the road in front of us grew bleaker and wilder over huge russet and olive slopes, sprinkled with giant boulders. Now and then we passed a moorland cottage, walled and roofed with stone, with no creeper to break its harsh out, outline. Suddenly we looked down into a cup-like depression, patched with stunted oaks and firs which had been twisted and bent by the fury of, the, of years of storm. Two high, narrow towers rose over the trees. The driver pointed with his whip. Baskerville Hall, said he. Its master had risen and was staring with flushed cheeks and shining eyes. A few minutes later, we had reached the lodge gates, a maze of fantastic tracery in wrought iron with weather-bitten pillars on either side, botched with lichens and surmounted by the boar's, boar's heads of the Baskervilles. The lodge was a ruin of black granite and bared ribs of rafters, but facing it was a new building, half-constructed, the first fruit of Sir Charles' South African gold. 
Through the gateway, we passed into the avenue, where the wheels were again hushed amid the leaves, and the old trees shot their branches in a somber tunnel over our heads. Baskerville shuddered as he looked upon the long, dark drive to where the house glimmered like a ghost at the farther end. Was it here? he asked in a low voice. No, no, the yew alley is on the other side. The young heir glanced around with a gloomy face. It's no wonder my uncle felt as if trouble were coming, it, coming on him in such a place as this, said he. It's enough to scare any man. I'll have a row of electric lamps up here inside of six months, and you won't know it again. With a thousand candle power, Swan and Edison right here in front of the hall door. The avenue opened into a broad expanse of turf, and the house lay before us. In the fading light, I could see that the center was a heavy block of building, from which a porch projected. The whole front was draped in ivy, with a patch clipped bare, with the patch clipped bare here and there, where a window or a coat of arms broke through the dark veil. From this central block rose the twin towers, ancient, crenellated, and pierced with many loopholes. To right and left, the turrets were more modern wings of black granite. A dull light shone through heavy mullioned windows, and from the chimneys which rose from the steep, high-angled roof, there sprang a single black column of smoke. Welcome, Sir Henry. Welcome to Baskerville Hall. A tall man had stepped from the shadow of the porch to open the door of the wagonette. The figure of a woman was silhouetted against the yellow light of the hall. She came out and helped the man to hand down our bags. You don't mind my driving straight home, Sir Henry, said Dr. Mortimer. My wife is expecting me. Surely you will stay and have some dinner. No, I must go. I shall probably find some work awaiting me. I would stay to show you over the house, but Barrymore will be a better guide than I. Goodbye, and never hesitate night or day to send for me if I can be of service. The wheels died away down the drive, while Sir Henry and I turned into the hall, and the door clanged heavily behind us. It was a fine apartment in which we found ourselves, large, lofty, and heavily raftered with huge bulks of aged blackened oak. In the great old-fashioned fireplace behind the high, behind the high iron dogs, a, fire, a log fire crackled and snapped. Sir Henry and I held out our hands to it, for we were numb from our long drive. And then we gazed round us at the high, thin window of old stained glass. The oak paneling, the stag's heads, the coats of arms upon the walls, and the dim, somber, and subdued light of the central lamp. It's just as I imagined it, said Sir Henry. Is it not the very picture of an old family home? To think that this should be the same hall in which for five hundred years my people had lived. It strikes me solemn to think of it. I saw his dark face lit up with boyish enthusiasm as he gazed about him. The light beat upon him where he stood. The long shadows trailed down the walls and hung like a black canopy above him. Barrymore had returned from taking our luggage to our rooms. He stood in front of us now with the subdued manner of a well-trained servant. He was a remarkable-looking man, tall, handsome, with square black beard and pale, distinguished features. Would you wish dinner to be served at once, sir? It's ready. Is it ready? In a few minutes, sir, you will find hot water in your rooms. My wife and I will be happy, Sir Henry, to stay with you until you have made your fresh arrangements, but you will understand that under the new conditions, this house will require a considerable staff. What new conditions? I only meant that Sir Charles led a very retired life, and we were able to look after his wants. You would naturally wish to have more company, and so you will need changes to in, in your household. Do you mean that you, your wife and you wish to leave? Only when it is convenient to you, sir. Oh, your family have been with us for several generations, have they not? I should be sorry to begin my life here by breaking an old family connection. I seem to discern some signs of emotion upon the butler's white face. I feel that also, sir, and so does my wife, but to tell the truth, sir, we were both very much attached to Sir Charles, and his death gave us a shock and made these surroundings very painful to us. I fear that we shall never again be easy in our minds at Baskerville Hall. But what do you intend to do? I have no doubt, sir, that we shall succeed in establishing ourselves in some business. Sir Charles' generosity has given us the means to do so, and now perhaps I had best show you to your rooms? A square balustrated gallery ran round the top of the old hall. Approached by a double stair from this central point, two long corridors extended the whole length of the building, from which all the bedrooms opened. My own was in the same wing as Baskerville's, and almost next door to it. These rooms appeared to be much more modern than the central part of the house, and the brighter paper and numerous candles did something to remove the somber impression which our arrival had left upon my mind. But the dining room, which opened out of the hall, was a place of shadow and gloom. It was a long chamber, with a step separating the dais where the family sat from the lower portion reserved for their dependents. At one end, of, at one end, a minstrel's gallery overlooked it. Black beams shot across above our heads, with a smoke-darkened ceiling beyond them, with rows of flaring torches to light it up, and the color and rude hilarity of an old-time banquet. It might have softened, but now, when two black-clothed gentlemen sat in the little circle of light thrown by a shaded lamp, 
One's voice became hushed and one's spirit subdued. A dim light of ancestors in every variety of dress, from the Elizabethan knight to the buck of the regency, stared down upon us and daunted us by their silent company. We talked little, and I for one was glad when the meal was over and we were able to retire into the modern billiard room and smoke a cigarette. My word, it isn't a very cheerful place, said Sir Henry. I suppose one can tone, tone down to it, but I feel a bit out of the picture at present. I don't wonder that my uncle got a little jumpy if he lived all alone in such a house as this. However, if it suits you, we will retire early tonight, and perhaps things may seem more cheerful in the morning. I drew aside my curtains before I went to bed and looked out from my window. It opened upon the grassy space, which lay in front of the hall door. Beyond two copses of trees moaned and swung in a rising wind. A half moon broke through the rifts of racing clouds, and its cold light I saw beyond the trees a broken fringe of rocks, and the long, low, and the long, low curve of the melancholy moor. I closed the curtain, feeling that my last impression was in keeping with the rest. And yet it was not quite the last. I found myself weary and yet wakeful, tossing restlessly from side to side, seeking for the sleep which would not come. Far away, a chiming clock struck out, out the quarter of the hours, but otherwise a deathly silence lay upon the old house. And then suddenly, in the very dead of night, there came a sound to my ears, clear, resonant, and unmistakable. It was the sob of a woman, the muffled, strangling gasp of one who is torn by an uncontrollable sorrow. I sat up in bed and listened intently. The noise could not have been far away and was certainly in the house. For half an hour I waited, with every nerve on the alert, but there came no other sound save the chiming clock and the rustle of the ivy on the wall. That is the end of chapter six. Who do you think is crying? Email me and let me know. Have a great day.